Good afternoon, good evening, and probably good morning. This is Bill Weinberg, Director of Communications with Komodo Cybersecurity. Welcome to our latest Learn, it, Learn IT webinar, Detect and Prevent Known and Unknown Malware in Real Time. Before we get started, let me just give you some housekeeping information. This webinar will be available uh, on demand from Bright Talk probably within a day of the webinar ending. You'll be able to view and possibly download portions of it from the Bright Talk platform. During the webinar, if you have questions that you would like to pose to our presenters, we will be having a Q&A session near the end, and we will address questions from the audience. So feel free to use the question box on your Bright Talk user interface and submit your questions. We're eager to hear from the audience. This webinar will be approximately 45 to 50 minutes of content, followed by that Q&A and ending up at the top of the next hour. So that being said, let's get started. Um, we are recording today's session, by the way. There will be attachments for downloading. Our presenters today are Fernando Montenegro, a Senior Analyst of Information Security at 451 Research, and Gus Evangelakos at Komodo. He's Director of Field Engineering, Advanced Endpoint Protection. So without further ado, I'm going to hand off this webinar to Fernando. Hello, everybody. Uh, Fernando Montenegro here. Just by uh, way of quick introductions, uh, as the slide says, I'm an analyst on our information security team. I'm uh, uh, originally from, from Brazil. I'm now here in, in Toronto, Canada for many years. And I've been in this industry for a long time, uh, well over 20 years in, uh, in security. And over the time, my, uh, my interests, uh, the, they include I mean, enterprise security architecture, network security, endpoint security. And um, I've also been doing some work around uh, cloud. In terms of other interests, I say there are security economics and, and, and security at scale. I think that we are in a fascinating time in, in our industry to do the kind of things that uh, that we do. Uh, I am, I try to be active on Twitter, so I've asked Montenegro on Twitter, and if you, if you want to, to talk there, by all means. Uh, just before we get started, by way of a, of a, a personal note, I am fighting off uh, one of those annoying conference uh, calls that we get. So there might be uh, sneezing and coughing throughout the presentation. I do apologize. Now, before we jump into, uh, into the content, one, I just wanted to position where I'm coming from for our conversation today. I'm looking at things as an industry analyst. I want to, to convey to you what we're seeing happen in the industry as it, what, on what relates to endpoint. Right? I think that there is a, there's significant movement, which we find uh, very interesting for organizations of all sizes. So let's get started. Why are we talking about, so the, one of the questions we ask in our surveys, and I'll talk, I'll talk about the surveys in a second, is that we ask organizations what are their main pain points. And you see that user behavior is by far listed as the top concern for organizations. Why are we talking about user behavior in what is theoretically an endpoint security conversation? Well, because if there is one thing I want you to take from this is that the strategic importance of endpoint has very much to do with the fact that it is on that endpoint that user behavior lapses happen. It's on the endpoint that someone clicks on a link they shouldn't click. It's on the endpoint that someone answers a phishing message that they shouldn't. It's on the endpoint that someone uh, uh, installs software just because they need to do something. So what it means is that security for the endpoint is a fundamental aspect of modern security architecture. Now, I wanted to present a little bit where am I coming from in terms of uh, what's informing some of our research. And there are two main pillars to, to the content I'm providing you. On one hand, we have independent briefings and inquiries and research that we do as, as analysts. So hundreds of hours on a, on a regular basis talking to enterprise IT folks, talking to service providers, uh, talking to uh, finance professionals, talking to a number of different uh, stakeholders. And this is done com completely independent, uh, uh, very high focus qualitative research. 
we here at 451 we complement that with a very strong uh, program around uh, surveying user populations you may have heard of the 451 voice of the enterprise uh, surveys uh, and what we do here is that on a regular cadence we'll uh, we'll send out questionnaires tackling different areas of security now these are not uh, uh, th these are well controlled for response biases and and uh, and sampling considerations and so on so th this is a high quality survey that allows us to make some very interesting uh, extrapolations from um, from the data we get I expect that, as a matter of fact, some of you on the call may be, may be some of the people answering those surveys. So on that note, thank you very much for your contributions. Now, when we talk about endpoint, one of the things we want to define is what do we mean? Endpoint is something that's been shifting a lot recently. And the focus of this research right now is we're looking at, as, as the, the slide says, it's software that's deployed on a laptop, a notebook, et cetera, an end user device of some sort. Usually Windows, 95% of the time, 90% of the time, with some Mac OS rising and very, very little uh, Linux. That being said, with, and within that endpoint, we're looking at things such as how does malware happen, how do exploits happen, how do I protect the system from executable content, and so on. We're not yet uh, covering server-based uh, endpoints in, in, in this research, nor are we covering mobile for now. Right? This is a, an area of, um, this is an area of, of uh, evolution as things keep moving forward. Some of the other things that we expect to see that we're, that we're not covering that also have an endpoint presence are things like DLP, things like vulnerability management and so on. They, don't, they, they have endpoint agents, but they're not within the survey. Now, what are people doing with those endpoints? So we used our survey, and we asked how are how satisfied are the user population how satisfied users are with different use cases for endpoint security. And what I find fascinating about this chart, the way to read this is that so the top line talks about pre-execution protection. So you can see that a significant number that's the, 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 the red on the, on the left there, are very happy with their endpoint solution for that, uh, for that uh, feature. Some are somewhat satisfied and so on. But we, we do see that there is a, a shift in that as people switch to different use cases within endpoint, there are different levels of satisfaction. Right? So for example, people are expecting more out of their endpoint tooling for things like investigations. So this is an interesting data point. Another data point we would like to talk about is just how many endpoints, how many agents do we actually have on those endpoints? Uh, and what we've seen is that there is a significant proportion of people who have between one and five endpoint agents. Now, uh, some organizations have a very high number of agents, we saw there, but that trend is decreasing. So we are very much aware that organizations are looking at consolidating their endpoint footprint, so trying to address as much functionality as possible within uh, a smaller number of endpoint agents. Right? <coughs> I apologize. So within, that, um, within the fact that people are looking to do more with their agents, what are they actively trying to do? And the way we look at it as a, here at 451 is we try to think of endpoint functionality in terms of a life cycle. Not necessarily a kill chain that, uh, that people refer to, but more a life cycle itself. So the way to, to read this is that, so prevention refers to functionality that protects the user from even getting in contact with the, the, the threat in the first place. Right, so this might be things like reputation control, things might be some level of, of app control and so on. We have a few more slides on this. Then there is the, the set of protection features, which these are, okay, there is something happening on the device. There is an actual binary of some sort. What do I need to do to protect my user against that binary? Assuming that uh, that binary runs, 
then we go into more of a detection phase. Am I, I, I am analyzing that binary to figure out uh, what that environment is doing. Is there any sort of evidence of, uh, of uh, misbehavior? And then later on, if there is something wrong, we fall into the response. Right? So how do I respond to this? Is this something that I'm going to do an investigation or, or something like that? Uh, typically, as we talk about in industry, we refer to this set of functionality here as EDR, endpoint detection and response. And some people like to refer to this as the, the, the earlier part as endpoint uh, protection. Uh, some people like to use the next gen AV uh, terminology. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of next gen as a terminology, but I understand how some people use it. What I wanted to do next is to take some of those, is, is to parse a little bit what we mean by each one of these phases. So when we get into the, the first one is the prevention. What, what sort of technologies are we seeing on the prevention side of things? And this is, again, what is being done to help users not even be in contact with the malware in the first place. Some of the main technologies we see here is on number one, we see application control, uh, whitelisting, restricting which binaries people may be able to use, and that information about which binaries to allow or not allow is something that can either be done locally or can leverage cloud resources. Device control, so controlling uh, execution from, from USB devices or controlling access to those are, is, is very, very popular. Particularly interesting on the prevention side are integrations between endpoints and the rest of the architecture. So as I say here, proxy gateway firewall type integration, meaning that if, um, if a, a, uh, an endpoint detects something suspicious, it can coordinate with a firewall to block access to, to a command and control or to block access to, for some exfiltration, either for itself or just for other, uh, for other devices on the network as well. And uh, as, a, as an editorial point, I like to put hash lookups that are very, very cheap as a, from a computational perspective as something almost more like prevention. Then from there, we move into protection. And protection is more about uh, controlling or trying to understand what is a binary going to do. And uh, this is where machine learning has, has come of it on its own recently, uh, analyzing stack, the static field. Ah, static features. This is where we may be able to put the device into, a, put the binary into either a local or a remote sandbox. Uh, this is an area where uh, it's in, we've seen some interest around virtualization or, uh, or containment of, uh, of actions that the binary is going to be able to do. I mentioned the machine learning. This is one of the, the of course, one of the buzzwords in our industry. And this is one of those areas where, in some cases, uh, when we dismiss machine learning, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater in that machine learning in security is absolutely real and it's absolutely applicable in many different use cases, endpoint security being one of them, right? We've been doing machine learning in security for decades now. All the spam filtering that we do is basically machine learning but we've also been applying it to lots of things on the endpoint. And um, I mentioned there are static analysis, uh, behavioral analysis, and, and uh, supporting user-based uh, user interfaces, like you can, uh, natural language processing and so on. One of the questions that, uh, one of the things I, I always like to talk about machine learning is the notion that be careful not to confuse machine learning with just automation, right? Being able to move data, lots of, lots of data from one point to another is not machine learning. That is data engineering, that's automation. Machine learning, we are trying to predict, uh, we're trying to predict outcomes based on things that we have learned before, right? And one of the things that uh, I find interesting when you're, when you're talking to, when you're talking to uh, companies about machine learning is you're not necessarily going to ask them to, you're not necessarily going to evaluate the quality of their machine learning itself, right? There's numerous technical tests around things such as uh, receiver operator characteristic curves or confusion matrices and so on. That's not the kind of thing you're going to be asking. You're, what you want to, want to ask is 
How well does the vendor, uh, uh, how quickly do they update their models? How do they, me how do they measure uh, the effectiveness of those models and so on? Bottom line about the slide is that machine learning, very real, just make sure you have to ask the right questions. Moving on, on I, I talk a little bit about detection and I like to put an investigation as part of that. And that is when what we're seeing here is tooling that helps to perform either ad hoc searches across the environment or tools that, uh, that report on, on malicious behavior up to, a, up to a centralized environment. What you can see on the slide here is that the, the endpoint has some sort of EDR capability, perhaps some local processing, sends it to a collection of some sort. There is a, a layer of analytics to be done, and that layer of analytics can lead to automation, can lead to, uh, to uh, reporting and so on, and those things can feed back, and we can enrich that data from different sources. Right? So uh, EDR is a very interesting aspect of, uh, of endpoint security nowadays, something to, to, for us to keep in mind. Then lastly on that, on that trend, we have uh, what happens on the response side. The key element around response that we have found has been the, the rise of automation, and that automation can include both orchestration of different security controls within the environment, as well as something specific to the endpoint. Perhaps we're doing, we are, we are quarantining either the process itself or quarantining the host. Perhaps we are, we are uh, starting additional forensics collection and so on. In some cases, people like to do uh, deception as well on the, on, as a response capability. Here at 451, we refer to something called security automation and orchestration as the discipline that, that looks into a lot, of, uh, a lot of this. What I wanted to, so we talked a little bit about the technology trends within the endpoint itself. I wanted now to move to what we're seeing as broader industry trends that may be relevant to this conversation. So there are a couple of things that, uh, that we want to cover. <coughs> Number one is on the technology side. And I alluded to that a little bit early on, but I think that one of the most important things for organizations to be aware of is that endpoint security becomes strategically important as the endpoint becomes a point of control in, the, in any sort of security decision. The same laptop that is happily sitting on a corporate network or is happily uh, sitting at the, at the client site, next thing you know, it might be on a home network that's not as secure. Next thing you know, it might be at the proverbial coffee shop or the airport network. So the endpoint has to be able to defend itself. I think that's a fundamental thing. Alongside that, another thing that's important that's been happening on the endpoint is that the base operating system has been improving. So there are, there's, there's additional security functionality being offered on the endpoints themselves. And in some cases, uh, that, that uh, technology is something that you can plug into, whether it be encryption, whether it be some level of, uh, whether it be some level of, uh, of protection early on. So it is a trend to be aware of, right? What other trends we have seen are how are customers, or in, and by customers I mean enterprises and other, uh, I mean not individuals, right, not consumers. How are people behaving when it comes to uh, endpoint security? And some of the more interesting trends we have seen are, first of all, there is an acceptance of this assume breach mentality. And what we mean here is that people are looking to equip themselves to move beyond just having a single protection layer and be done. They are looking to instrument how can they determine if something bad, uh, first of all, that it happened, and then that it's been properly contained. So having that kind of tooling is something that's become more important over time. Uh, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned the single agent uh, as an element, so people are looking to do more efficient deployment of agents. So packing more functionality into a single agent. And uh, as a side note to that, being able to leverage, to manage those agents from a SaaS type cloud-based management, 
as opposed to having to, to spin up much infrastructure themselves. Lastly, uh, people are exploring the other approaches that, uh, that may help to reduce the attack surface. Some people are doing browser isolation. Deception is something that, uh, that pops up every now and then, as does uh, whitelisting and others. When we look into the products themselves, I mentioned before that uh, uh, machine learning and uh, AI is something that's now very common within multiple endpoint products. Uh, we are seeing some interesting approaches around people monitoring behavior at the system call levels, as opposed to just uh, <coughs> as opposed to trying to to, to do just single hash lookups, etc. And um, that funnel I showed earlier about different layers of, of uh, inspection throughout the, the the life cycle of an attack are, are very very popular as well. Just wrapping up. What are we seeing on the threat market uh, side of things? On the threat side, uh, ransomware is still quite prevalent. Crypto miners have, rise, have risen significantly uh, recently. Uh, there is a significant concern with living off the land, right? So people leveraging things like PowerShell and others to, uh, to do some of their attacking. So that's something to be aware of as well. When we look at, at uh, market trends, all the products keep evolving, so keep paying attention to what's happening on the, on the endpoint. I, I, I find that EDR is an area that sees lots of attention from different markets, and um, that means that people are paying more attention to their, pro their endpoints. They're doing better testing of those endpoints. I just wanted to, on, on the point about uh, EDR being heavily contested, what I see, what this slide, what this diagram depicts is that EDR as an area is something that is an adjacency to multiple areas, including, of course, endpoint protection itself. That's a very close relationship. But we have uh, vendors approaching this from the DLP side. Uh, they start doing EDR. Vendors approaching this from IT and system operations. So they used to do patch management, and now they can do EDR. And, and, and so on. Lastly, we have one other, I, I talked a little bit about testing. There is a significant interest in doing better testing on those endpoints themselves. Uh, testing the products either by looking at what the, the industry is doing, uh, AMTSO stands for the Anti-Malware Testing uh, Standards Organization. Uh, so that helps to, to guide how should products be tested. Uh, the MITRE attack framework, you may have heard of it uh, recently, is something that has emerged as a lingua franca for discussing capabilities around an attack. Uh, so it stands, um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a very good framework to look at, okay, so what kind of coverage do I have against these particular types of attacks? And uh, we have seen a number of customers starting to pay more attention to doing their own efforts, right? Whether it's using open source tooling or using open source intelligence to do some more, uh, some more testing themselves. <coughs> on that note, thank you very, very much for, for listening. I'll now pass it on to Gus and, uh, and uh, we'll talk more during the Q&A phase. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, that was a very great discussion. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gus Evangelakos, um, and I am the field engineering director here at Komodo, um, where we essentially try to make sure that all customer needs are, um, are addressed in many different use cases. And uh, during the presentation, I will help you know, show exactly how we address everything there. Um, prior to that, I want to give you a little bit of uh, background about who Komodo is, uh, for those that might not know. But um, essentially, Komodo is a 20-year-old cybersecurity company. And as many of you might know, we started in the um, certificate authority uh, business. Essentially, over the years, uh, we became the number one um, CA authority in the world. And from that, we have had um, a lot of insight into the needs of security for many different customers, which helped spawn a much of our cybersecurity practice. So from that, currently, we have 87 million agents deployed around the world, representing almost every country in the world which gives us great intelligence as to what type of malware or other threats are emerging. 
We have a global headcount of 1,300 employees, most of those focused in cybersecurity uh, and development, um, with a portfolio of over 250 patents. Um, in addition to that, we have invested heavily into our R&D, uh, making sure that we're constantly keeping up with different types of threats and also finding solutions to those threats, okay? Um, now, one thing that we have um, identified and learned is that there's no way to potentially prevent 100% of malware from entering your network. Um, you know, from everything that Fernando just discussed, um, a lot of that is based on detection type methodology, and you cannot always detect everything to prevent 100% of malware coming in. With about 120 million new samples of malware um, coming out every year, and this was just in 2017 statistics, um, even if we look at just the 1% um, that's not being covered, uh, as we all know, you know, we constantly see the 99, 99.5% detection rates out there. That 1% really equates to a lot of malware still being able to come in through the door, right? So if we look at 3,000 threats per day at 1%, it still makes you question, is my, you know, machine learning capability uh, well, good enough? Is the model, as Fernando mentioned before, as up-to-date as possible? When was the last release that came out? And have there been any new types of tactics that this model cannot predict? Right? So if we're relying on machine learning to have the most advanced capabilities, and even at that point cannot essentially detect 100%, uh, we still have you know, 3,000 threats per day that could potentially bypass those capabilities. So when we look about um, you know, how the defense depth strategy has worked over the years and how we have tried to achieve as close to prevention as possible, um, you can see that we've had signatures um, early on, uh, and then we started layering behavior analysis and sandboxing to help alleviate some of that, um, you know, uh, the threats that were bypassing this, uh, the signatures. Then we started including host and intrusion prevention, and lastly, AI with EDR at this point. And what we have come down to, as I mentioned before, is the 99% detection rates, right? So then we wanted to ask ourselves here at Komodo, what is it that we can do to help customers with the 1% problem? Okay, so that meant really studying um, and understanding what, really, what malware was really doing to endpoints and how to cover the, that 1% that other companies just could not detect. So what we wanted to do was create a, um, a technology that initially protects the users, um, but at the same time, could, would allow the user to execute files without causing any type of um, block to their, to their work or day-to-day -day functionality. And so what we did is essentially created what we call containment, okay? And containment at Komodo uh, gives you the default deny security posture with the default allow usability. And what that means is when a file needs to execute on, on an endpoint, essentially it would require write access to three key resources on that endpoint, which is essentially the write access to the hard drive, the registry, and the comm interface. Now, what we have understood is that if we simply allow any malware to go, um, you know, to execute on a uh, endpoint device, and we've never before seen any kind of, kind of characteristic to help prevent it, what we wanted to do was replicate those three key resources and so that it cannot infect the system until we know exactly what that file wants to do. And so our auto containment technology still gives that user the ability to actually launch the file. Um, it's just gonna be in a protected environment on that endpoint. Now, the other thing to that is that we wanted to make sure that it was a very lightweight agent. And so we didn't create any type of virtualization or VDI environments where you have to offload the workload. We wanted to make sure that the protection stayed on the endpoint wherever that user was without any type of updates or any detection type based methods. And what we have created here is the ability to protect against any zero day malware um, and at the same time allow that usability that users need um, to, to help prevent any phone calls to the help desk of my file got blocked, I can't open this, et cetera. Now, how does containment work? In Komodo, we have a multi-layered agent. Um, and as Fernando mentioned before, we also understand the need not just for protection, but also to help consolidate all the solutions that every customer out there is using and go from two to five endpoints, as you saw before many customers had on Fernando's slide, um, and essentially compile that into one endpoint, one solution, and provide a platform as opposed to just another piece of the puzzle. 
And so we have a multi-layered agent with antivirus, with HIPS, firewall, um, behavioral analysis, and containment to make sure that you have that defensive depth uh, strategy posture and also give you the ability not just to use detection, but also have that last line of defense, which is containment. And that is uh, specific to Komodo's offering. Now, in a typical scenario, um, you know, the first thing you want to do is prevent with signatures, device control, et cetera, which is included in here. And the first thing we know is that if a file is a known bad file with a signature, we simply just need to block that, make sure it never executes on the user, and essentially prevent that. The other part is to also have the ability to allow any known good file um, to execute, meaning I want to make sure that my operational sustainability doesn't get affected because I need a new security posture, a new security tool. We want to make sure that our users are still able to run, execute, and work as they're accustomed to and prevent the help desk calls um, that usually come out with a lot of the new next-gen AVs out there using machine learning due to the false positives, right? When you use machine learning and your training models, a lot of times you're going to train on, on things that are also, um, you know, the code that's also in good files can be found in bad files. And essentially what happens at that point is, you know, a machine learning algorithm can only statistically tell you if something's good or bad, but you still have to come and make decisions and add some context to that good or bad decision of that model. Um, for us, it's a simple, is it a good file? Is it a bad file? Is that signature known before? Have we seen it? And if in this case, if it is a good file and we have vetted it, we will simply just allow it to run. The main challenge comes for unknowns. How do we protect against unknown files that have never before been seen? The methods have never before been seen. There's no possible detection methodology to essentially block this outbreak. Okay, we've seen that time and time again when um, hackers are using statistical ways now to pack malware. They're also using packers to try to, you know, um, bypass those machine learning capabilities. And so when you can't rely on a detection type methodology, what is there to protect you? And that's where containment essentially comes in. We have a 87 million endpoint footprint around the world. And what that does is it provides us that intelligence that we need. We, on a daily average, we uh, analyze about a million and a half unknown files every single day. And we verdict that for customers um, every single day. Now, out of that, we find about 5 to 10% that are malicious. How it works is if a file is known bad, we will simply block it, as I mentioned before. If it's good, we will allow it. If it's unknown, right, as then we have billions of different tip types of signatures up there, we would simply just put it in containment, where on the endpoint, it automatically launches in a containment screen, and it has a little green border around it indicating to the user that this file is running in containment. They could still interact with the file. They could still... Um, you know, work with it, but at the same time, that file is not able to infect anything on the system. It won't be able to overwrite or encrypt your files because we will only simply rep um, do a representation of those files to it. If it tries to modify them, we would just reroute it in a different location. If it tries to gain any type of persistence via the registry, we also provided a fake registry. We will not know, let an unknown file modify anything in our registry that you know, essentially we have no idea what this file's intentions are. And so for that purpose, it could not gain any persistence, okay? And then lastly, if it's trying to infect or attack the memory space um, of another file, we would also block that as well. Because again, we don't know what this um, unknown file is trying to do, if it's trying to inject something um, or do anything in the memory space of another file, that would also be blocked. At the same time, we are sending that file to our Valkyrie um, verdicting engine where we use AI and human intelligence to essentially make a decision for all our customers. The one thing we wanted to do was not only give the ability to protect the system on the endpoint, but we wanted to offload the event management and the decisions of these files from the customers and give them the capability to not have to worry about it and make it as automated as possible. So what we do is we upload that file to your own Valkyrie instance. We use machine learning to verdict 95% of the files. And then for the rest of the files, the 5% that machines cannot predict or you know, detect if, um, if there's any type of ma uh, malicious behavior in there, we will automatically forward it to a human intelligence team. We have researchers all around the world, and they will give you a verdict on that file within four hours, automatic to your portal. There's no file submission that you have to do manually or open tickets. It would automatically be uploaded, forwarded, and a verdict will be given within four hours. Now, 
what that means is that you no longer have to worry about that event and that user calling and you know trying to understand if the file is good or bad. Our team will do that for you, and it would automatically just run when that decision is made. We also provide full kill chain analysis, so you understand the type of threats that they are, um, including the severity level, if it's a Trojan, if it's a backdoor, if it was a ransomware attack, and even display exploit type information to understand if you are a targeted attack trying to use a vulnerability in one of your applications. Now, with the predictive threat intelligence that we also offer, we can see um, if those threats, again, are trying to target your organization, if it's a zero-day attack that has never before been seen, if it's trying to use any type of exploits. At the same time, see if they're trying to harvest any data from your users, um, you know, essentially to have a data leak, um, and also give you the ability to look into botnet activity. Maybe there's already an infected device in your system where we can coordinate that using our EDR tool and our um, threat intelligence to let you know if there's some type of malicious botnet activity already in your organization. Now, as a platform, Komodo offers multiple solutions uh, across our security uh, posture. And we have created a, a portal where we include not just simply security tools, but the way to manage your environment as well. As we all know, security starts with just simple patch management and vulnerability um, detection and um, you know, remediation. And so we have also given you the ability to have remote control functionality, patch management, hardware software inventory, um, and automated procedures where you could actually automate, it, automate all your IT tasks on the endpoints. Um, procedures can give you the ability of um, essentially anything that Python can do. And we have a whole team that is dedicated to writing scripts for our customers. So even from simply grabbing logs, event logs, resetting local admin passwords, uninstalling software, anything could be automated through our Komodo One platform. Um, on top of that, we also have our Sea-Watch network monitoring. On our endpoint solution, we have EDR, um, as well as all the other layers that, as I mentioned before, and auto containment being that last line of defense to give you that full visibility and chain of attack. Um, on the other hand, we also have our dome products, which are boundary solutions, helping customers um, prevent malware from um, a proxy perspective, making sure that their cloud users or people working from home are also protected when they're browsing the internet inside and outside your office, blocking them from malicious files. And we've incorporated containment within our proxy service as well, so that unknown files will also be contained even if you don't have our endpoint solution. On the other hand, you can also block um, any type of um, personal identifiable information or PCI data, or you can actually create any type of um, you know, uh, information types that you want to block and also prevent users from going to specific sites to essentially block any type of uploads or anything that they're not supposed to be doing. And lastly, we also have our secure box application where we can help protect the data. Uh, in many cases, applications are still susceptible uh, to key logging and other types of remote attacks. And SecureBox takes the approach of protecting the data and the application, even if a, an, an, a device is already infected. Meaning if an attacker has been successful in bypassing all your security measures through your network and your endpoint, and they want to install a key logger um, to essentially record information or keystrokes from an application or from a user, what we can do is protect the application so that those leaks never come out from that application. Um, lastly, I just want to leave you off here. Um, we have a malware scan, so that way you can actually understand what unknown files are out there. We call it the Unknown File Hunter tool. And if you would like to get a free analysis of that, you can simply visit enterpriseacomodo.com and just click on the free forensic analysis to identify any type of unknown malware that might already exist in your network. Okay, and that's all for my part. Thank you. I will pass it back to Bill. Thank you, Gus. Thank you, Fernando, for a very interesting presentation. We're prepared to take questions from the audience. I have a couple here that we'll get started with. Um, let's see. Um, a question actually for both of you. Let's start with Gus. Uh, one of our attendees is saying that uh, he doesn't have the ability to rip and replace his current antivirus setup. Does the Komodo solution or in general in the marketplace can you only replace a piece of it or augment existing solutions? What about, uh, what do you have to say, Gus? 
Yes, absolutely, Bill. Um, and thank you for that question. We have many customers that use a lot of legacy AV with huge deployments where rip and replace is just simply not an option for them. But as I mentioned before, a lot of the detection capabilities that are out there, even machine learning, is just not capable of blocking that last line of 1% that goes undetected. Essentially, what we can do here at Komodo is simply layer containment with Valkyrie Verdict to be the last line of defense for you and your company. And we work side by side with any of the vendors out there for security. Um, we have deployed that for many of our customers, which is simply containment and a simple layering on top of that. And even if a piece of malware is mutated, hacked, whatever it might be, if it's unknown to us, we will contain it and help protect that system. Fernando, can you address that? question from an industry standpoint in terms of monolithic solutions versus layered ones? Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, because we have seen more, um, we have definitely seen an interest in solutions that work together. I remember one of the trends I mentioned earlier is that there's a there's an ongoing improvement in the operating system. So then uh, being able to potentially leverage just what the operating system offers to begin with and then have something on top of it for additional functionality is um, is something that is becoming more and more uh, more and more accepted, more and more common. <coughs> Sorry. Fernando, you also mentioned earlier that there is this term being thrown around of next-gen antivirus. And I know that in my experience, when I hear next-gen, I tend to associate it, well, it seems to be a, a marketing hype term, but I also tend to associate it with alert fatigue uh, and the idea that uh, while next-gen may employ things like AI and machine learning, it also tends to grind down the IT staff with almost too much unmanageable information. So tell us a bit more about your take on next gen and, and what you think it really means and what the challenges are. Well, I think that the, you, you, you raise a good point. The next gen is uh, the, the terminology next gen. Uh, I think we're getting a little bit past of it now, thankfully, but uh, we have in, in this, like I said, I've been in this industry for a while. We have, uh, we had associated the next gen firewalls, next gen AV, next gen. It's almost as, it, it, it's something saying, hey, this is new. This is something that, uh, uh, we're doing something different than, than, than the other team, right? Than the other people. And, um, I think it, it, almost people should ignore the terminology and actually test it out for themselves, right? Because, uh, AI and, and machine learning, like I said, I, I'm, I'm, uh, a huge proponent of them in that they do address right they do address significant elements of this conversation not all but significant elements so there is a, there is room for that but next gen uh i i would almost i almost count as negative like the word is to use next gen but uh, going back to people should be able to test it themselves and and yes there is such a thing as as uh, alert fatigue and anything you can build in your environment to help you either automate some of that response, uh, automate the investigation, uh, or even better, avoid the problem in the first place. Right? That would be uh, that would be advisable. Um, Gus, how does Komodo deal with these challenges, especially e event fatigue and? Um, what are the hallmarks that would uh, that you would cite around next generation, especially in terms of what's unique about the Komodo offering? Uh, great question. Uh, the one thing I do know is, you know, as Fernando mentioned before, machine learning is definitely something that has um, brought the prevention capabilities much higher than we were in the past. But it also has come with many challenges around event fatigue. Um, and again, the reason for that is when you're training these models, um, you know, essentially malware is just illegitimate code. I'm sorry, legitimate code doing illegitimate things, right? And when we train these models, um, the only ability you have is to either dial the statistical um, predictability up or down, which means I'm either going to detect more or prevent um, less. And the reason for that is because you can't just adjust the model on the fly. You're relying on the vendors to adjust their models, and this isn't a quick thing because they have to, you know, classify and do a lot of different changes um, to their algorithms to come up with a new model. And, and so you're kind of just pigeonholed in what you currently have and then relying back on blacklist and whitelist. 
And so when you start generating a lot of these events and you're putting the burden on the customers um, to decide if something is good or bad, um, you know, it, it essentially comes, it becomes a very daunting task because when you have five, ten events a day and then they pile on and every day at the end of the week you're left with 80 events that someone has to review, your users are still calling and complaining that they can't run their files and it, most customers, you know, just to get everything going and making sure their users are operational might just approve a file even though they haven't done any research to understand if it's good or bad. Um, what we wanted to do here, Komodo, is just take that decision making um, and question marks out of the customer's hands and help them by doing the work for them. Uh, we wanted to make sure that using containment, we can protect them against those zero day attacks, making sure that the endpoint is isolated. We also made sure that the users can open and run the files so it gives the buffer between the customer, I'm sorry, the user and the IT department so they don't call the help desk immediately. And at the end, we want to also make the decision to the customers completely automated. And that's where Valkyrie Verdict comes in, making sure that, you know, the files that need to run are operational. The machine learning is there to give you quick, uh, you know, detection, I'm sorry, um, quick decisions. And at the same time, using hum human intelligence to finally make a verdict for all customers within the four hours to make sure that, you know, they don't have to do that. Thank you, Gus. Another question that came in is about threat hunting, a term that comes up a lot. And in fact, this morning, I was even in a conversation myself with others in Komodo management about what threat hunting really means. Someone compared it to a hunter going through the jungle where the threat is every bit as likely to um, eat the hunter as the hunter is to catch the threat. Um, Fernando, tell us your view on threat hunting and what it really means and if there's any value in it. So threat hunting is a is an interesting topic in that uh, first of all by by way of definitions I mean I look at threat hunting as an expansion of that assume breach mentality uh, that I mentioned so uh, so what so what's the scenario right the organization has some security capability they are looking at the alerts that they have uh, they are processing so the SOC or the managed provider or their day to day is ongoing. There are security incidents being investigated and so on, and that's fine. Threat hunting is having some of your teams, uh, independent of all of that work, go look for other elements within your infrastructure that might indicate that something bad has happened. So uh, uh, using a hypothetical example, let's say that um, one of your threat hunters comes across uh, a particular uh, IP address as uh, something that's malicious for a, uh, uh, hello? 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 The hello. music is somebody nice. Needs, somebody needs to mute. I don't think this is coming. There we go. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, so uh, it could be we, we are hunting through the music like it's uh, the, the Peter, <laughs> the wolf, Peter and the Wolf, right? Uh, there we go. We're back. Uh, Hello? Please mute their lines. Fernando, I'm sorry, I don't Yep. I'm not sure who it was. Okay. All right. Are we are we still here? back to I'm yep. Here also here. I'm sure the audience is still here. Let's go back to talking about that's right? music. Oh, okay. So uh, we, as we were hunting through the music, so the point I was making is that threat hunting is independently looking for incidents, of, or for indication of incidents within your environment, like completely separate from your day-to-day -day operations, from your today to day investigations. Now, uh, is threat hunting a valid exercise? I think that yes, but threat hunting is a valid exercise given that you have, that you are looking through what you have to look already, right? So it, it's very interesting uh, technically, like it's very engaging, a very, uh, it's a very uh, stimulating uh, intellectual exercise to go hunt for these things. But uh, in all fairness, I think that uh, organizations have to have their house in order a little bit more before they jump into threat hunting. And uh, so it's absolutely something that people should look into, but uh, as a, uh, a crawl, walk, run type of scenario. 
not not jumping into it in uh, instead of doing other things. Gus, what do you tell Komodo prospects and Komodo customers when they ask you about threat hunting? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh, it's kind of like the same thing that Fernando said, right? Um, some teams are able to do that and some other teams are not. For me, the primary question is what is the customer's ultimate goal and what are they trying to achieve? Um, if protection is what they want to do, that's what Komodo's focused on is protection first. And we've developed technology to do just that for them. Um, for us, you know, detecting and everything else comes after. We want to make sure that we protect everyone. And threat hunting, for instance, um, for us could be anything from looking at different accounts that are logging into computers, uh, potential CNC communication, and we can offer that, as I mentioned before. Um, but again, it all depends on the capabilities of the customer and what they can do with the resources that they have. Um, you know, for us, again, first and foremost is to alleviate as much effort from the customer while enabling as much protection and security as possible. Thank you. We have one more question, and then we'll be wrapping up. And it is a, an open-ended question from an audience member, and let's ask Fernando first. What's next for the endpoint industry? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so we looked at, uh, I talked about a, a number of trends, right? So I think that the endpoint industry is evolving in importance, right? So I think that I'm, I'm a network security person at heart. That's where I started my career. That's, uh, so it's, it's, um, it's kind of difficult to, to, to accept this, but to some extent, network-based uh, systems are losing a little bit more uh, are losing a little bit of their efficacy when you when you consider things like encryption, when you consider things like user mobility and so on, which means that the endpoint security becomes a a critical component of modern security architecture. So, uh, first of all, I think the end, the industry is going to continue to grow in importance, right? What this uh, and what that means is that we're going to have to have more capabilities within the endpoint that we were typically using the network for uh, that will concentrate on the endpoint and to some extent on the applications. But uh, one of the things that I think we are going to see is some of that coexistence we talked about earlier. Like more, uh, more and more people will use different agents or even base operating system functionality to do some things, uh, meaning that the endpoint security components will have to operate in an environment uh, cooperatively with other tooling. I think that's uh, that's something for us to be aware of as we uh, as we move forward. And if it's not immediately clear, I think that the benefit of being able to have your endpoint tooling leverage information that the rest of the world has is absolutely something to be aware of and something to and something to, to to use right so if you are able to have uh intelligence that comes in to help you uh, expedite things or to help you prevent a threat from the first place well i think that uh, that only continues to grow i would say <coughs> sorry right. oh please thank you so much and just to close up gus what would you say is next for endpoint or at least next for komodo uh, thanks, Bill. So, um, I mean, what we've been seeing, again, is a consolidation, right, uh, making sure that you don't have multiple shoes, multiple agents. Most customers are asking us, how much can you do? They don't want to manage multiple platforms and solutions. Um, the other part is, again, to resonate with what Fernando said, you need to go beyond just, you know, technology on the endpoint. Um, at this point, you need to see the different threats have different uh, threat intelligence that you can feed into your products, and making sure that, you know, the botnet activity that you saw in one end of the world could be addressed immediately on another. Um, and at the same time, we want to make sure that, you know, the network capabilities that um, network security has had is also put on the endpoint and micro-segmenting from applications and making sure that, you know, the firewall components on the endpoints now are more strict, making sure that, you know, propagation of malware or other threats of just, you know, ex exfiltrating data um, is mitigated by using different types of technologies on the endpoint. Um, and here at Komodo, uh, to leave this off, essentially we're starting with the intelligence first. Um, you know, we have our threat intelligence platform ingesting millions of files daily. We have all these different types of techniques of capturing botnet activity. Um, because we offer DNS services, anti-spam solutions, 
We have a lot of information about different types of threats and how they emerge, and we can apply that to all our solutions from endpoint cloud um, and you know, other services. All right, thank you very much, Gus. We're almost at the top of the hour. We have um, no more major questions here. We did have someone wanting to know whether and when we would be having webinars on anti-spam. All I can say is please stay tuned. Come back to our Bright Talk channel and or the Komodo website at komodo.com to learn about future webinars and other technical areas. You can also reach out to us directly. I think that, um, that Gus has his email and contact information up on the slide deck, which you can download in a few hours after we wrap up this webinar. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our presenters, Gus Evangelakis and Fernando uh, Montenegro. And I hope, Fernando, you're feeling a little bit better. The thank you. you guys put in <laughs> the effort you guys put in today made this a very interesting webinar, and I'm certainly eager to see the next time we all get together and have a conversation like this. I want to thank our audience for their attention today and invite you back to future webinars. We will be having another webinar in a few weeks on threat intelligence and elections. And with that, um, we are going to, oh, um, I just got a, a note here. If you want to know about anti-spam, there's already a webinar that's available for on-demand download on our Bright Talk channel. Just go searching for it. But if you can't find it, do reach out to us directly. So uh, we're going to call this a wrap. Again, thank you all for attending. And we look forward to having you attend our next webinar. So have a good afternoon or a good evening, depending on where you are. This is Bill Weinberg saying goodbye until the next time.